we do have, as usual, several skeptics in the chat, and we do appreciate our skeptic friends. That's why we do these live. We hope to plant seeds and address challenges. And so Gutsy Gibbon, she is a popular evolutionist YouTuber, and we're actually going to be responding to one of her videos very shortly here. And so she says, and she's a teacher, she says, Bergman and Donnie are misunderstanding a topic, so we're happy to engage the criticism that she just taught, taught to her students. She's saying what is beneficial is context specific. So for example, the sickle cell anemia, it's beneficial for those who might be in an environment where they could get malaria. Okay, well, firstly, sickle cell anemia is bad. That's a, a bad disease. We don't want that. Not, uh, and malaria is also a horrible disease. So either way, <laughs> it's bad. But the point we're trying to make, and, and feel free to respond to this, Dr. Bergman, is that when you actually look at the genotype or under the hood, like I, I like to say, these, although context specifically uh, specific, are damaging. It's due to something broken, a pre-existing system that's breaking. Jerry, can you speak to that? Yeah, it's true that they are context specific, that whether they're beneficial depends upon the context or the environment. That's true. That's not. And in dealing with cancer, you realize that they are, they eventually cause the, the death of the organism. And so you might have some beneficial mutations that in some situations may be helpful in some areas, but by and large, the vast majority are in the long run negative and cause damage to the genome, causing damage to the organism, causing cancer. And we know especially a lot about this because, well, not only cancer, but many diseases are a result of mutations, cancer especially. And you, I guess you could probably find if you looked at some of the mutations that are involved in cancer, we know many, P53, P13, P12, there's quite a large number of mutations we're aware of. Now, if you look at those, there may be in some situations where it is beneficial, but in the long run, as the mutations accumulate, they're always negative, and that is why cancer eventually, unless it can be cured by killing the, the genes that cause the problem, unless it can be cured, it, it, it's always lethal. And that's the goal, of course, of treating cancer, is <laughs> to <laughs> sorry, destroy the genes, they destroy the cells that, uh, and ideally genes, if you can, but almost always the cells. I think that's a great point. And one illustration I like to make that I've never seen a good <clears throat> response from the evolutionists in terms of this contact specific argument and the nature of beneficial mutations is if I temporarily wanted better gas mileage in my car, I could remove weight off the car. I can start destroying the car. Essentially, I can remove the seats, remove the, uh, you know, side windows and basically just make the car a lot lighter. And so temporarily I'd get better gas mileage, but overall I'm destroying the car. And right. so there's like a, a narrow benefit you could say, but in terms of total functionality of the car, it's not telling us how we built the car and it's not really making the car any better. Is it Jerry? No, no, it isn't. Yeah. And so, so that's the way I see, because she says this boils down to redefining fitness. I don't think it's necessarily redefining fitness. I think it's just common sense that, yeah, we might have some narrow increases in fitness in some of these cases of beneficial mutations, Jerry, but overall it's, it's reductive to total functionality of these organisms. Would, would you agree with that? Oh yeah, that's true. And uh, even in the cancer, the genes that cause cancer, there may be some beneficial effect to some of the changes that are made. But by and large, when you have some that occur, you have others, and then that beneficial effect will be wiped out very quickly. Right, I agree. And so she follows up here with, with, with a fair point. And so we'll have you engage it, Jerry. And so her assertion is, all mutations are the result of an error in DNA replication. It's like a typographical error in a text right. or protein synthesis. And I like to define a mutation as basically an alteration in the nucleotide sequence of DNA. So she says these errors are beneficial in many contexts. But we would point out that in those, even in, in those benef beneficial mutations, typically they're reductive. And then she says, and can even create brand new proteins. Jerry, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's possible you can get some new proteins or certainly change the, the, the structure of it. But again, 
Hotspots is a major issue. Not only hotspots, but you have a number of reasons why the vast majority of mutations are problematic. And uh, th these are words, words she's stating. I'd like to see, and it, you may even get one case with this shown to be true, but we don't need one case. We need thousands of cases in order to produce a new organism. And again, the, the negative mutations, the deleterious are going to swamp the organism eventually, and that's, that's going to die. Although it's interesting, you do get some people, George Burns is the best example, who smoked cigars all his life. I guess one cigar is about equal to a pack of cigarettes. Smoked cigars all his life, lived to be 99, and died because he fell in the bathtub. And, you know, wow. And, and some people, it seems they're just, and, and evidently the problem is, or not, the, the situation is, is where their body is so effective in repairing the, the, gene, the genes that are damaged that they can abuse their body and live to be quite you know, like George Burns, 99, although I'm not sure how many, how many examples there are like George Burns, but it said if you live to be like 75 or 80, you probably live to be 95. And uh, I noticed in looking at the obituaries, a lot of people die in their 70s. Yes. And then you seem to have people who die in their 70s, and then a lot of people die in their 90s. And <laughs> you certainly... Have some die in their 80s, but there seems to be if you make it so far, you'll make it 20, 10 or 20 years farther. And how common that is, I don't know, but it's something that's been observed. Are you familiar with the example? Because she, she puts forth what she thinks is the best or one of the best examples. She says, my go-to new protein is the antifreeze in cold water cod and in uh, ice fish. So just on the spot from my understanding of that, basically of these fish in cold water, and it's argued or asserted that they evolved these new antifreeze proteins that basically gave them the ability to now survive in this cold water. And I think they say, yeah, it's due to a, a new protein. But I think they're inferring that from the past. I don't think they observe this in real time. They just see this, this effect that the fish are having. And so they propose duplications followed by neo-functionalization, therefore a new protein. Uh, what would be a good response to that, Jerry? Yeah, I'm aware of that. It's just I need to yeah, it's one a situation I studied a few years ago, but I have to look at my notes to be able to remind me remind specifically what happened but yeah there are cases like this that's not the, but you need more than a few cases few right like cases saying. don't really say much a and this could, by your home it takes a yeah. lot more to get the whole house a exactly dollar isn't going to do it you can give them a few you can give them a hundred like we were saying i think the fact that there's a few that we could sit here and argue about all day is actually testimony to how weak evolutionary theory is because there should just be no question there should be hundreds and hundreds that they they could present i would even argue that this example because there's another one notothenioid antifreeze arctic fish i believe it is where there has been some work done that suggests this could be epigenetics where basically they have these pre-existing genes that are turned on when they enter these environments because we know environments can result in these kinds of changes and those genes are already present they're just turned on and now they can adapt rapidly yeah and to me they use a few examples which may be valid but that from these few examples they're trying to prove a very broad generalization which is evolution and to me it's like saying well we've got an influx in our town of people from spain and uh the 25 people in our town from spain one has committed a robbery another one has committed a rape another one has committed some other crime therefore Obviously, people from Spain are criminals, and they should be locked up because look at we only have twelve in our town, and yet we have three major crimes committed by these twelve, by these, uh, by these, by these three, whatever. And so, therefore, you're trying to generalize to the entire population, and of course, you can't do that. And we've done that with tragic results in the past when we generalize from the blacks end up black males, young black males get in trouble. And we generalize that to the whole population. And that's commonly done, and yet there's a problem. 
Hitler did the same thing with Jews. He had a few examples which proved his thesis. And obviously, these few examples were only a few examples, but he generalized that to the entire population. Those are some good points, Jerry. You mentioned hotspots, mutational hotspots. Do you believe as time goes on, we're going to find that there are many more hotspots than those in the evolutionary community would admit? Because a lot of the evolutionists, when I, when I argue with them, including PhDs, they'll say, well, these hotspots are probabilistic. There's not as many as you creationists are saying, rather than the hotspots or the mutations occurring in a, a deterministic fashion. Jerry, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, it's true. The only reason you'd look for hotspots would be in a mutation that has caused a problem. And so therefore you evaluate them for hotspots. And the fact is, though, we only look at primarily mutations which cause disease, etc. unless we're concerned about some other issue like uh, pigmentation or something else. But on the other hand, my, my supposition is if we looked at a million genes that mutated, we would find in the vast majority hotspots. Now, I can't prove that, but the fact is we found so many, many hotspots. And if you look up in any index of genetic evaluations, you find that there are many we know of. I'm not sure if anybody has looked for how common they are, but from my experience, the ones I'm aware of, they're quite common. Yeah, I think that's a great response. 